and they really, it's really an education gap. They, they feel as though they don't have enough information on how to measure social and environmental performance. They feel as though they don't have information on what investment opportunities out there. They feel as though they don't have information on what um, the track records of those investments are. Um, and to be frank, there just isn't a lot of that information available now. Um, but again, I think, um, I sort of go back to, it's all of our individual responsibilities. So Morgan Stanley Smith Barney actually launched launched a retail platform called in Investing with Impact platform on their retail um, for all of their retail customers. I happen to be a Morgan Stanley Smith Barney client. Um, the minute that came out, I called my financial advisor and said, what products are you going to put me in? Because now you no longer have an excuse. Your own firm launched a platform that provides you with, you know, a hundred different opportunities for investment. Now put me in that. Um, and so I think, you know, there's some level of of how the banks, like Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, their social, environmental, and community-based investing group put this platform together and are really educating their financial advisors about it. And so there's sort of the top-down approach and the bottoms-up approach to really um, start driving um, momentum within the, the retail market. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Justina. Um, Ralph, you talked a little bit about leadership. Okay. And as the corporate <laughs> next to me and the challenges, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about, um, I would say, some of the challenges or, you know, that you may have faced in integrating you know, ESG. And Justina, you, know, you also raised the point of just defining you know, the challenges that we have internally in trying to drive you know, CSR and really integrate it into core business practices, right? Um, is really about defining what, I mean, I get, sometimes I have execs who are completely, they don't understand what SRI is, what is ESG, and that's very real. And I think that's where a lot of corporates are. You've got champions, you've got leaders. Um, you know, at BOAML, we have like, what, 280,000 employees, and you've got pockets of innovation, but sometimes, quite frankly, the right arm does not know what the left arm is doing, and it's a huge challenge. And I, but I think that this is where the majority of you know, Fortune 500 companies are. And so I think that you know, we have to learn and we have to figure out how do we drive in a, innovation, right? And of course, you know, build the right kinds of strategic partnerships with the foundations and the you know, high impact organizations to really drive this agenda forward. So, um, could you talk a little bit about um, how you have, you know, built a corporate culture that really integrates ESG along so it's, it's, it's fully, you know, it's about your business and it's not like philanthropy is a peripheral, but you're, you're purposely like measuring the kinds of uh, strategic partnerships that you enter into with nonprofits. I guess the main issue is uh, the lack of appetite for venture capital investment. Um, it's more on funding, uh, as I said earlier, relevant technologies that are tried and tested. The other issue is uh, to do with sweet spot. What may be the sweet spot? I was sitting in a panel upstairs just now listening to somebody talk about, um, you know, the, the sweet spot for fundraising for various projects. And unfortunately, that's our sour spot, the 20, 50 million US dollar spot. Um, Two billion US dollars is probably easier for me to get than 20 million US dollars. So that's a key issue, is uh, actually finding a, you know, an investment that meets the criterion. But it's the absolute return that also has a very strong impact on the type of outcome I get from the director. So at the end of the day, I, I can't go for the two billion investment because that's handled by a different team. So I'll, I can't get the 20, 50 million US dollar. So um, I probably go for a piggyback type investment which is say 10, 20%, two or four, five million US dollars, where we let other people uh, do the EPC, we let other people handle the BOT structure, and we just sit on a 10, 20% investment uh, of that. The, the issue is not with the culture and the DNA, I think it's more to do with the challenges of the returns and the assets that you deploy, or the resources you deploy, to actually do the due diligence, and then the O&M in the type of investments we make. So, if we had an independent fund manager, um, which we do for a couple of funds, but they're renewable energy funds, so we just focus on companies that are purely in renewable energy, uh, that's third party managed. Now we're trying to set up what I'm pushing for is a private equity fund which will invest in that 20, 50 million dollar 
sweet spot, but not just our money, but also uh, other IPPs in Malaysia and Singapore and Indonesia. And that maybe make it easier. The challenge is, again, to do with the uh, stakeholders, um, the, the shareholders, the directors, uh, and internal uh, constraints in terms of the resources available. And I think that's one issue which will uh, actually spread across all the corporates in Asia, because you're talking about we're not, we're not down the line in terms of maturity or sophistication of the European or US companies. We're still very largely family controlled. Uh, so that's the status. It's not, a, it's not a problem. It's just where we are in terms of the uh, maturity of the type of companies that even public listed companies here. Um, it's the ownership structures and the family control businesses that dictate that type of approach to the business. Uh, on that point, um, I, I know that, uh, Justina, you also have experience in uh, private equity. Uh, what do you think it will take, uh, both to, to this question and goes to you to Ralph, is to really mobilize the capital from institutional investors into this area, for one. And then also, the other question being, um, uh, you know, the, the needs, right? How, do, how could we seed, uh, how can corporates help seed or be part of this discussion uh, where there's grants needed from, or not even grants, the 10,000 to what 250,000 is what's needed. You know, that that's what I keep on hearing uh, earlier in the session that um, some of these uh, social enterprises really need the expertise um, to get the investors to be interested in investing in them. I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. What can corporates do, perhaps, to really help? You know, through coalitions, partnerships. Uh, what have you, perhaps through knowledge transfer? I don't know, uh, but maybe you can both comment on that. So I might not follow directions and just answer the question that I, I would have liked to have been asked <laughs> rather than that one. I mean, I think the simple answer to your first question is there needs to be a track record. Um, but, um, I, so a, a couple of thoughts. I think um, w there are a lot of different ways in which corporates, not not through their CSR or philanthropy can really engage in these markets. We, Rockefeller actually just launched with the UN Global Compact a framework for how multinational companies can engage in impact investing and social entrepreneurship that was launched at Rio Plus 20, so I encourage you all to, if you're interested, take a look at it. Um, but there's also this, this broader concept of hybrid value chains and shared value um, that has been promoted in the US, but I actually think works really well in Asia precisely because um, these are family-owned conglomerates, um, and they're, you know, the, the sort of publicly traded companies aren't as well-developed. And, and, you know, when you're not beholden to the short-term shareholder demands that, unfortunately, a lot of, uh, a lot of publicly traded companies are, um, and you're, you're family-owned in which that decision-making can be quite concentrated, then you have a lot more power over what you do within your business operations and practices. And there are a lot of really great ways to integrate social impact into your supply chains, whether that's sort of, um, if you are a, if I'm going to use a publicly traded company example, if you're Nestle and um, milk supply is obviously very critical to their business, I mean, it's sort of the most critical piece of their business. Um, you, most of your supply comes from developing countries. Um, so you really have a strong, compelling business reason for securing the quality and amount of that supply to ensure that there isn't that kind of volatility that would really, um, could really create fluctuations in your margins. And so what Nestle has done in their sort of shared value practices is really provide um, technical assistance um, to dairy farmers, that includes artificial insemination practices, includes um, improved feedstock, it includes, um, you know, cooperative type models to aggregate the supply. Um, and they're doing this for business reasons, not for charity reasons, and, and, and there's a very strong, compelling case for them um, um, to, to do that. And, th you know, that's just one example. A lot of other companies are doing this. Um, and so they're, you know, I'll, I'll circle back and maybe answer part of your question as well. I mean, the, the grant-making side of corporations can also um, actually seed some of that activity as well. So um, they could provide a grant to an organization like TechnoServe that does all of the hard on-the-ground work to organize these smallholder farmers, whether they're dairy farmers or if they're you know fruit producers for Coca-Cola or if they're, um, uh, I don't know, I can't think of it, cocoa farmers for um, in Ghana. Um, so there's... There's ways in which um, the corporate foundations can also provide that seed capital 
for that technical assistance capital, but I think the real promise for large corporates really is within their business practices, supply chains, operations themselves, and, and the more you can have sort of champions within the organization that can spend the time thinking through how to integrate all of that, um, the more impact that you can have. So. Sorry, I did not answer. I know, we did. <laughs> Uh, just very quickly, yeah. I mean, in our dealings with uh, companies that we work with on carbon mitigation, uh, you know, we come across a lot of uh, very strong initiatives. People like uh, f um, uh, Dutch Lady, um, uh, part of the Dutch Campina Group, and uh, they're geared towards very much uh, an issue of uh, the relevance of the business to the marketing. Um, so whatever initiatives that they embark on will have to have direct relevance for the outcome in terms of boosting the top and bottom line, but primarily the top line, because they can work on the bottom line uh, later on. So it's a revenue-driven type uh, uh, investment decision. Um, the other companies we've worked with, uh, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, um, you know, we find that the NGOs that we jointly uh, work with together uh, on those uh, initiatives um, and the experts that we have, like, like John, Jonathan Porritt, I'm sure those from UK will know his name, um, who also serves on Unilever, who's also served in Syme Derby and also in, uh, uh, in Wessex Water. Um, we, we obviously have a, a great deal of, um, I'd say there's a lot of ideas which are mixed between the groups, but the relevance has to be directly towards uh, our group and our business. So. Um, I'd say returns and relevance is going to continue to be the, the recurring theme amongst these companies. Um, and I don't see that changing for another 10 years or so uh, in Asia. Thank you so much. I think we're getting a little bit short on time. So I want to make sure that uh, we have enough time to field some uh, questions. I, I do actually want to um, throw out something that I, I happened to read um, two days ago. Um, I don't know if a lot of you know of the organization called Committee to Encourage Corporate Philanthropy, which is a round table of CEOs and chairpersons uh, based in New York. It's, uh, I think they have like something like 175 members now, and they're, they're whole, they disseminate a lot of research, and you know, it's really interesting. But um, one of my, somebody I know there actually did a poll among these CEOs and chairpersons, and I thought that it was very relevant to the discussion today in terms of how we can engage these corporates going forward uh, and, and really bringing them to the table. Because, you know, I think some of these major social environmental problems um, are a result of what the corporates are doing. And so they absolutely are a stakeholder group that needs to be fully engaged. And so, you know, one of the questions that um, uh, the poll asked CECP when they, they polled these CEOs, what is the biggest barrier your company faces today? and preparing to address the oncoming social problems that are important to your business. And it was an overwhelming, like 47%, overwhelming complexity of social problems was the answer, okay? Followed by difficulty collaborating or aligning with our company's stakeholders, okay? So the other question is, what do you think is the appropriate role of a company in solving a social problem that is important to its business? And 50% said, drive the solution, take leadership and ownership over getting results, followed by be part of the solution, collaborate in problem solving without seeking a leadership role. So I think there's like, you know, despite, of course, there's cynics, but there's a lot of opportunity here. And it, it, we, we need to, I think, really figure out ways to really build these kinds of coalitions that, you know, Tide Foundation has driven. I mean, Rockefeller, you've, you know, your research is phenomenal and it's very widely read. And I think that you can, as you continue to like publish these reports on metrics, you know, you're gonna get interest from various investors. Uh, at the end of the day, that funding is gonna go to help scale these social enterprises. And so having said that, I'd like to throw it out to the audience. Um, love to have some questions for our wonderful panel here. No questions? Okay, please. Hello, I'm Helen from the Singapore Economic Development Board. We obviously represent, represent a lot of companies and industries and actually we're very interested on how we can encourage a lot of companies who are beginning to think about this but really don't have a champion or 
don't know how to begin. Um, we see more and more, of course, of the impact investors in the social enterprises coming to Singapore, like all of you. Um, but then, we, of course, we see a lot of this opportunity. I just wanted to ask you what your recommendation would be on how to, like we are, the theme of this panel, how to change the mindset of corporates. Um, is it, how do we expose them? Or is it more on a one-to-one -one engagement? Is it finding the right person? Um, is it events like these? Um, is it by sector? So would just like to know from your experience, so for example, the Nestle example you brought up, how did they begin working with those cooperatives and what were the main challenges and what would you, I, th I think what we're all hoping for here is we can learn the lessons from what you all have done in the US and in Europe um, and make it work for Asia quicker, more efficiently and more effectively. Thanks. Well, I'll start. My Again, this sort of goes more back to uh, management consulting experience in CSR, but uh, rather than tides. But I think that one of the biggest takeaways we had was that if you don't have buy-in at the C-suite level, um, it's really not going to work that well. And corporate social responsibility as as charity or philanthropy is is um, unfortunately all too common, and I think that the the aspiration and the goal that that we always had was uh, making sure that CSR was more about a holistic sustainability strategy for a company and not about these sort of one-off initiatives. And you know that's that's not unique to Asia. That's still very much uh, the case in in the U.S. I think Europe does a better job um, than North America. I think. Also, one of the other things that, that I think is, is important to note, too, is that engaging them and making sure that the ask is tied to relevance. So all too often, um, nonprofit organizations or foundations would come to us and they were disappointed that a company wasn't participating in a certain initiative. Well, that, that an, an initiative, while, while noble, may have had nothing to do with their global supply chain. So, if, you know, and the example I used earlier about partnership on a women's health initiative, well, you know, uh, you know, there were some of the usual suspects who were very interested in training women workers on factory-based issues um, because, you know, that's the right thing to do. But when we did return on investment studies and actually quantified the return on investment in healthier women workers in the form of reduced absenteeism, lower turnover, and higher productivity, we went from having two or three companies involved into a 50 company initiative, so. So in that example, is sure. the catal catalyst, the Tides Foundation uh, research into absolute return for the company if they invest with, or if they, if they work with the social enterprise? What is the catalyst for the company to change their mind? Mm. And what, who, who has that role? Who do we engage and how? <laughs> I think it's a carrot and a stick approach, right? You, you. I, I think there's a role for it. Might be philanthropy. It might be others um, to conduct that research, to highlight the case studies, to tell the story. Um, and it's either a carrot or a stick or both, right? It's sort of in the long term, these companies need to be able to see the risks that their business practices or the the long term unsustainability of their business practices propose, right? Um, investors need to also impose a. a, a um, uh, a, a penalty on their stock prices for their long-term unsustainable business practices. So there's sort of that, that, that stick approach, and, and that's really primarily going to be driven by the advocates. Um, that may be foundations, that may be champions within the companies, it may be CEOs with a long-term vision. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side, there's the carrot approach in which you can, again, highlight the successful case studies and show how, um, if you're able to tap into Nova Nordisk here, you know, here in Asia, in China, actually, um, tapped into the massive diabetes insulin delivery market and because they figured it out. Um, no one else had done it yet. Um, and so that's a carrot. You know, others can look at that um, and the return that they were able to deliver as a result in the massive market they tapped into. And you start highlighting that and people can start, you know, if you're a, a um, you know, a CEO or just a go-getter within a company and you want to move forward in your career, then what better way to do that than to find new mm -hmm. markets, new products that can really deliver um, financial returns to your company. Um, but you're right, I mean, there's a lot of inertia and so I think it's the role of the catalyzers, those with the more flexible forms of capital to tell those stories, um, to maybe take some of that risk, um, provide the demonstration effect, um, 
but it's it's not a it's 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 not a short term sort of process. Uh, very unusual for a Malaysian to be giving a Singaporean advice, but uh, <laughs> as those of you who come from the region will know, in I'm fact, also Mal not from Singapore. <laughs> oh, okay, in fact, <laughs> most of our good people from Malaysia are here anyway. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I just from our experience, I unfortunately feel that. Uh, the government needs to take a, a very much more proactive role. Uh, parts of that could be to do with reporting, mandatory reporting. Um, and I think that forces companies. You've got some really good examples here. Uh, City Developments Limited, the property developer under the Quek family, uh, Keppel Group, Sambawang. You've got some excellent examples. I mean, those are just three of the many that I could name in Singapore who've done a, a really good job at reporting. And they've got GRI rated uh, sustainability reports. Uh, but what will force more to report and what will force more to have assurance of those reports? So audited reports on not just sustainability initiatives generally, but carbon as well. I mean, we saw Clegg the other day talked about carbon mapping being ex extended for many UK companies beyond the ETS. Uh, amount of companies in the UK that will have to report on carbon, but that being actually expanded to something like 2,000 companies of the, the top UK companies. So those type of initiatives I think are very important. That's where the government, EDB could advise. I mean, I know the EDB has got an interesting role here, um, and you've got many you know, semi-government type departments and institutions here that could steer the government in that sense, and I'm not sure whether it's purely an EDB type task, but pushing in that direction, I think, will definitely help, is mandatory reporting of many different levels. It's not just the depth, it's the breadth as well. So we're going across all the different facets of ESG. Um, and I think that will force people into, again, assurance. And then once we, once we measure, we manage. If without the measuring, if we're not asked to report, we probably don't start to measure properly and we may not manage. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're out of time. I'm getting the signal. <laughs> so I wanted to thank my wonderful panel here and to all of you for attending this session. Thank you. Let me just really quickly just thank the panel again on behalf of IAX and Shujok. I think it was really uh, insightful to hear more from the corporate side but also the foundation side. Um, with that, I would like to welcome you to go to the Shaw uh, Auditorium again for the final sessions of today. And maybe you can grab a cup of coffee on the way. I hope there's time for that.